India's G20 guest list is getting shorter. First, Vladimir Putin pulled out and now Xi Jinping could be doing the same. Reports say the Chinese president will not be attending the summit in New Delhi. Instead, the Chinese premier will fly down. Now, just a disclaimer, this is not official yet. We've not had confirmation on this from either India or China, but the rumor mills have been buzzing for a while. Indications were that Xi Jinping will not come. The obvious question is why? Why wouldn't Xi Jinping visit India? He traveled to Bali for last year's G20 summit. He also traveled all the way to Johannesburg for the BRICS summit earlier this month. So why not New Delhi? The report does not mention the reason. Chinese and Indian sources have said that Xi Jinping will not attend, but they've not said why. And come to think of it, it's not really surprising. China has repeatedly tried to sabotage India's G20 presidency. They have skipped at least two meetings, one in Arunachal Pradesh and another in Jammu and Kashmir. They've also been blocking joint statements after most meetings. The West wants tough language on Ukraine. Russia and China want it watered down. But these are political objections. Some of it has been petty and absurd. Earlier this month, China objected to India's G20 motto. It's Vasudev Kutumbukam. It means the world is one family. What possible objection could you have with that? China said the motto cannot be included in G20 statements. Why? Because Sanskrit is not an official United Nations language. If you put all of this together, what do you see? Sabotage. China is least interested in India's G20 presidency, so Xi Jinping skipping the summit is not unthinkable. It's very much according to their script. But yes, the reasons could be more than one. For instance, the US was hoping for a meeting between Joe Biden and Xi. The last meeting was also at a G20 summit, the one in Bali last year. So the White House was betting on a repeat in New Delhi. In fact, they worked quite, they worked quite hard for it. Top U.S. officials have been making a beeline for Beijing. The latest was America's Commerce Secretary. So the groundwork had very much been done. But maybe Xi Jinping is not interested. Maybe he's had enough of talks. That could be one of the reasons why he's not traveling to India. His closest G20 ally is Russia. But Russian President Putin will also not be in New Delhi, which means Xi would have to face the West alone. Perhaps he doesn't want that. The second possibility is bilateral tensions with India, namely the border. The situation in Ladakh is yet to be diffused, and on Monday, China released a new map, a map that shows Indian territories of Aksai Chin and Arunachal Pradesh as parts of China. And that was an important signal. The map was published just 12 days before the G20 summit. You don't do that before a major summit, at least not if you're planning to visit. So what message does it send? Is it the formal announcement of the East-West Divide? Well, geography may not be the answer here, but politics could be, and I'll tell you why. China's new map does not just claim Indian land, it also claims most of the South China Sea. And who else claims this region? Countries in Southeast Asia, like Malaysia, Vietnam, the Philippines, and Brunei. So China's map is an affront to all these countries, not just India. And why is this important? Because before the G20 summit, there is another major event, the ASEAN Leaders' Summit. Indonesia is hosting it from September 5th to 7th. All Southeast Asian nations will be attending. And in case you're wondering, no, Xi Jinping is not expected to attend that summit either. So the message is clear. G20 or ASEAN, China will not back down. They're intent on raking up border issues and creating trouble. But where does that leave the G20? Well, honestly, it is a challenge. The G20 is the only grouping that brings the West and its rivals together. It was a place for common minimum programs. No miracles, but no disasters either. But if Xi Jinping is indeed skipping the summit, it could set a new trend, one where the G20 becomes even more irrelevant. As for India, it's a fresh challenge. Xi's absence may reduce the prospect of a US-China face-off in New Delhi, but it also reduces the prospect of breakthroughs. Because what she can do, his premier cannot. And maybe that's the point of this decision, a snub to the existing world order. Is Russia attacking Poland? Not with missiles and bombs, but by other means. It's a question that's being asked in light of some recent developments. In the last few weeks, Poland has seen a sudden rise in train accidents. There have been train derailings, accidents, and even the, the hacking of their rail network. What explains these incidents?
The railways are important for Poland as for any other country, but in this case, they're equally important for the NATO and Ukraine, Polish railways. The Polish rail network helps deliver everything from aid to weapons to Ukraine. It is also a key route for world leaders who are visiting Ukraine if they're not flying there, which makes these attacks even more suspicious. Authorities believe there's a Russian hand in this. Our next report tells you if Moscow is sabotaging the Polish railways. Since the war broke out in Ukraine last year, a lot of world leaders have visited Kyiv. There was US President Joe Biden, French President Emmanuel Macron, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, EU Chief Ursula von der Leyen. You know what they all had in common? They all took a train to Kyiv from Poland. The railways are crucial for any country, but the Polish rail network is especially important right now, especially in the face of the war. It transports not just humanitarian aid to Ukraine, but also NATO weapons. Plus, it's the top choice for world leaders, which explains the scrutiny right now. In recent weeks, Poland has seen over 20 train incidents, accidents, derailings and many more. Plus, there was an attack on the rail network last weekend. About 20 trains were brought to a standstill. Poland authorities call it a cyber attack. Poland's trains use a radio system, one that lacks encryption or authentication. So, hackers apparently sent simple radio stop commands, triggering their emergency stop function. They interspersed the commands with the Russian national anthem and parts of a speech by Russian President Vladimir Putin. So, was there a Russian hand behind this? Well, no direct links have been found yet. The hackers seem to be ordinary citizens but they were apparent supporters of Russia. For now, two men have been arrested. They are in their 20s. One of the two arrested is a police officer. Authorities have now launched dismissal procedures against him. The attacks have raised serious questions over Poland's railway system and its safety. Polish state railway says there's no threat to passengers. However, they are looking at an upgrade. Polish trains currently use the radio system. But Warsaw wants to change that. They want to introduce GSMR cellular radios by 2025. They can be encrypted and cannot be sabotaged as easily. Poland has been a hub of support for Ukraine, and its rail network is crucial for the war-torn nation. So Warsaw fears there could be more potential attacks. This one may have been just hackers, but the next one could be more dangerous. It's not just in Europe. War clouds are gathering over East Asia as well, and it seems like Japan has spotted them. The country is planning major defense spending, a major defense spending blitz. How much money are we talking about? Around $53 billion. The request has been submitted by the Defense Ministry of Japan. If approved, it would be a record, Japan's highest ever spending on its military. But Tokyo's plans do not end there. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has a long roadmap. He wants to increase Japan's defense spending by 43 trillion yen in five years. How much is 43 trillion yen? Around 290 billion US dollars. If completed, defense would make up 2% of Japan's GDP. Now, to give you some context, NATO countries are required to spend 2% of their GDP on defense. Japan is not a NATO member, but clearly the thought process is the same. And we can't emphasize how important this spending is. Japan is a pacifist country. Their constitution does not provide for an army. They don't have an army. What they have is called a self-defense force. Plus, there is a lot of history here. Japan was an aggressor during the Second World War. Their neighbors have bad memories of Japanese militarism. So Japan arming itself is not just strategic. It is also traumatic for many countries. And Tokyo is aware of all of this. Since the 1960s, they imposed spending limits on defense, not more than 1% of the GDP. That's what Japan had. So why are they doubling it now? Why are they targeting 2% because of China and to a lesser extent because of North Korea as well? Last year, Japan published a new national security strategy, their first in almost 10 years. 
Look at what it says on China. The strategic challenge posed by China is the biggest that Japan has ever faced. And remember, this is a country that was devastated by nuclear bombs, whose neighbor is a rogue nuclear state, yet they call China their biggest challenge ever. It tells you what Tokyo is thinking. We will detail where Japan is spending this money, but first, some comparisons. At $53 billion, where would Japan's defense budget stand? At number nine in the world. The U.S. defense budget is around $877 billion, $877 billion. China is around $292 billion. Russia is third, India is fourth with $81 billion. Then you have Saudi Arabia, Britain, Germany, and France. If Japan spends $53 billion, it would slot in after France at number nine. Other countries are also ramping up defense spending, but not at this pace. The global increase in defense spending was around 3.7%. And Japan's around 13% in the upcoming financial year. And where is this money going? Around $8 billion has been set aside to upgrade missile defenses. This will help Japan counter possible attacks from North Korea. Around $500 million has been earmarked for fighter jets. Japan is making them with the UK and Italy fighter jets. Also on the list are Tomahawk cruise missiles, new destroyers, and also more cyber warriors. Japan's cybersecurity unit has around 900 personnel. The plan is to increase that to 2,400. All of this will make Japan a complete fighting force, not just against China, but against North Korea as well. You see, on Wednesday, Pyongyang tested two ballistic missiles. They traveled around 400 kilometers before landing in waters between North Korea and Japan. What was the purpose of this test? To rehearse nuclear attacks on South Korea. Pyongyang also conducted a separate drill on occupying the South. Now, these are simulations. They're practicing. But they reveal North Korea's thought process. They're readying for anything, and that includes war. The U.S. too is making moves in the region. They have approved another military package for Taiwan, a package worth $80 million, just peanuts compared to the earlier ones. But this one is special. It's called the FMF. That stands for Foreign Military Financing, FMF. And usually a package like this is a country-to-country -country deal. The U.S. gives this assistance to other countries, FMF. But Taiwan is not a country, is it? The U.S. follows the One China policy, so it recognizes Taiwan as a part of China. How then can this deal be legal? The U.S. says it does not violate their One China policy, but Beijing is not buying it. This severely violates the One China principle and the stipulations of the three China-U.S. joint communiques, especially the August 17th communique of 1982, and international law and basic norms governing international relations, and undermines China's sovereignty and security interests. China deplores and firmly opposes it. The Pacific is following the old military theory. The best way to prevent war is to prepare for it. And how do you prepare for war? By arming yourself. But more weapons also has a downside. It means more risk of a miscalculation. That's the big worry around this arms race in the Pacific, which is why open communication is so important. But don't expect much from China. Their policy is to poke neighbors and claim their territory. Confidence building is not their strong suit. As for Japan, the big challenge is to find a balance, a balance between the threat of China and the pacifist public opinion. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Florida, Hurricane Idalia left behind a trail of destruction and debris, destroying houses and entire towns, in fact. In South Africa, a blaze engulfed an entire apartment block in Johannesburg. More than 70 people have been killed. And there will be no monkey business at this year's G20. New Delhi has installed cutouts of langurs to deal with rogue monkeys ahead of the summit. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1997, Princess Diana died in a car crash in Paris. She was being pursued by paparazzi when the car spun out of control and crashed. Diana was taken to hospital, but she succumbed to her injury. She was only 36 years old at the time. We're leaving you with this. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
Thank you.